Hey folks, how are you all? Um, very welcome. Yesterday was brilliant. I actually love the discussions that we had. Let's continue that and do it again today. Um, Air Force session is going to be fascinating. Uh, we're going to in many ways talk about the world that it was, was, is and is going to be. We've framed it around the head of building a better society, which is an incredible social democratic team to start a day with. We have three fantastic speakers before I, interest them, before I introduce them. Um, the world that is going to building a better society. Um, we can do better. We can always do better. I think that's the whole raison d'etre of the Social Democrats is building evidence-based evidence policy to combat needs within society that we think ourselves and government would do a better job of. Um, when I was thinking about different characteristics or different areas where we could build a better society, I could think of any number. But actually, just this week, for example, I spent probably three sessions within the Dáil talking about the allocation of special education teachers for children with very complex and often neurodiverse needs, um, which was changed this week, for example. Um, they removed the criteria for special education teachers, which is going to impact 33% of schools, and most importantly, the children within them who need those assets and resources. Um, the government announced that change to the dismay of groups such as As I Am, um, Inclusion Ireland, um, the Professional Teachers Forum, teachers, parents who work with the teachers, and when we put it to the government, because those groups put it to us, the answer was, well, there'll be a review built into the system. And for me, I found that horrifying that we are playing Russian roulette with children who are the most vulnerable within schools. When you talk about building a better society, it starts with one that listens, it doesn't gamble with the lives of people. Um, so within this session today, we're gonna be talking about the economy, sociology, and the future, we're going to be listening from Michael Taft, the esteemed economist, also a constituent, so be very nice. Um, Mary Murphy from Maynooth, a fascinating insight on the world, and an old friend of the show, Liz Carolyn, who's a great friend and futurist, who's doing all sorts of magnificent things and has done in the past in terms of data and just really fascinating person. So um, without further ado, I'm going to welcome Michael Taft, Mary Murphy, and Liz Carolyn onto the stage. And Michael, you might present first. Well, in fact, um, the Social Democrats are inviting me here to talk to the theme of building a society that works. Now, there's many places to start that conversation. Uh, uh, I want to actually start it in the birthplace of social democracy, where social democracy itself started, and that was in the workplace. It started where men and women produced goods and services that people needed or wanted to buy. And certainly the workplace has uh, given rise to a considerable debate over the last couple of months. Over the last couple of months, every day, we have seen story after story about businesses closing, businesses coming under pressure, businesses being uh, 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 oppressed by uh, wage demands, uh, by uh, uh, government policy, uh, and that has led employers to now demand more subsidies more tax cuts, more handouts, but as significantly, they want to bring a halt to the small but not insignificant steps that the government has been taking in certain labor market initiatives, like the minimum wage, like statutory sick pay, like uh, uh, pension auto enrollment. Let's cut to the chase. This crisis in business, it's a manufactured crisis. It doesn't exist. Employer representatives have not put forward any verifiable evidence that suggests Irish business is in crisis or that any particular sector of Irish business is in crisis. All we have from them are unsubstantiated assertions and anecdote. I'll give you an example. Restaurant Association of Ireland claims that according to their survey, uh, which they've never published, uh, that there are 280 restaurants that have closed in the last six months. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised at that. And that's unfortunate that any business closes because workers lose their job, owners lose their investment. Uh, uh, but let's, let's be clear. Before COVID, in the years of economic recovery, each year over a thousand restaurants and pubs closed. Now, of course, more were created. 
Uh, that's the nature of that market. There is a high, very high churn. So the, are, the restaurant association's claims might seem significant, but they're not when we look at an historical perspective. But what they don't tell you is that over the years of COVID and the cost of living crisis since 2019, profits in the hospitality sector trebled, trebled. That puts a perspective on, on their claims. If anything, the retail sector employers are demanding even more massive tax cuts. But what they don't tell you is that again, their profits have risen over the last four years, COVID cost of living, and that Irish retail sales are going up at three to four times the pace of retail sales throughout Europe. Listen, let's call this for what it is. This is an old fashioned money grab for more handouts, subsidies, tax cuts to boost profits. And they are demanding that wages and working conditions be suppressed to protect their publicly subsidized profit margins. I mean, you really couldn't make this stuff up, except that they did. Um, OK, so that's how we don't build a society that works. Let's talk about uh, very briefly about what we can do to build a society that works, starting in the workplace, starting in the birthplace of social democracy. I'll, I'll just mention three. There are so many more. The first is we need a transformation of the workplace, a revolution, if you will, to maximize productivity, innovation, and working conditions. This is about creating the new workplace for the 21st century. What are those, some of those elements? And again, these are just sums, an actual living wage. Now, the government has made a good start, going to move to 60% of the median wage uh, by 2026. That's a good start. But the low pay commission has said, once you hit that, then you move the minimum wage up to two thirds of the median wage. In effect, that would abolish low pay in the economy. That would bring untold prosperity not only to workers and households, but would also bring prosperity to the business sectors that rely on workers' purchasing power for their sales revenue. Second thing we need are sh is a strong social wage. And what I mean by that is strong in-work benefits. Again, the government has taken some small steps uh, in terms of uh, uh, pay-related sick pay, uh, and pay-related unemployment benefit. But what social democracy has to do is extend and deepen these reforms. And I'll give you one suggestion. The next target that we should go for is family benefits. In other countries, maternity and paternity benefit paid to women and men are paid out, um, uh, are paid out uh, at 100% of the wage. In other words, if somebody uh, has a child in the household, or the mother or father, um, they get 100% of their wage through the social insurance fund. Here, it's only about 25% of the average wage. There, they realize that at a time when a household's expenses are going up, and it's very expensive to bring uh, a child into the world, at a very time that uh, expenses are going up, at the least they can do is maintain their income. So pay-related family benefits should be the next item on the agenda. Thirdly, a significant reduction in the working week uh, uh, to greatly enhance work-life balance. Uh, and it doesn't matter how that's achieved. Four-day work week, okay, good. Reduced daily working hours, that's good. Reduced working hours for households with young children or older workers, it, the instrument is not important. You will need a variety of instruments depending on the sector. The principle is to significantly reduce uh, the working age. Uh, sorry, the working week, and the right to collective bargaining uh, to help ensure that wage increases at least match productivity growth, to ensure that these reforms that are brought into the workplace are actually spread equally uh, 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 and even uh, progressively. But it's also to end the hypocrisy whereby employers can bargain collectively with their employees. They bargain through the agency of management, but when workers want to uh, bargain with their employers through the agency of trade union, no, the employers veto that. The law vindicates the employer's right to collective bargaining. It does not vindicate the right to employees' collective bargaining. A little bit of equality wouldn't go amiss. So all of these elements 
statutory wage floors, reduced working week, uh, in work benefits, collective bargaining, they have been shown to increase productivity, innovation, and firm performance. And they are already happening in embryonic form. We already see the seeds of, them go, uh, of that. So it is up to social democracy to extend and deepen that process and ensure that it's completed. Secondly, we need good companies. Good companies that will maximize the benefits of this workplace transformation, which will privilege investment over shareholder returns, invest in workplace training, upskilling, and career development that don't rely on precarious contracts and decarbonize in the pursuit of climate justice. These good companies should be promoted by everyone in every sector. And we can start that through ensuring that, through, that public sector contracts only go to good companies, that they are given enhanced grant aiding, that they are given special tax cuts, whatever it takes to incentivize good companies in the economy and help companies get to that stage. This is the good company dividend we should be offering. And third, finally, we need to negotiate our future. We need to plan it out. There's a program for government commitment that, that says that the government will set up sectoral task forces. And in those sectoral task forces, they'll bring together all the stakeholders to discuss all the challenges facing the businesses in that sector. Actually, that would be an excellent pace, uh, space to start negotiating pathways forwards. The only problem is they haven't been set up. And they're not likely to be set up. I don't know how it even got in the program for government. Probably one of Fianna Fáil's corporatist knee-jerk kind of things that they kind of put in because it hails from their past. Whatever the reason, there's been no action taken. In fact, this government actively excludes, actively excludes the largest stakeholder in enterprises when discussing strategic challenges to enterprises. The Enterprise Forum, it's a body that probably not many have heard of, but it's an enterprise forum. It's a forum, quote unquote, discussion of strategic issues that impact enterprises at national and international level. Sounds good, you know, it's a start. There are 12 employer groups, 12 organizations that represent employers. How many re organizations that represent workers? Zero, none. There are no unions on that. So the people who produce goods and services for enterprises, they don't count. The people who create the value added and the profits for those enterprises, they don't count. Those with the skills, experience, and ideas about their workplace, they don't count. We need these bodies with full democratic participation of all stakeholders, not just employers, employees in the state, but the relevant civil society organizations in that. And I'll just conclude and hope I didn't go over time. Um, comrades, brothers and sisters, fellow travelers on the pathway to social justice, whichever, whatever makes you feel comfortable. You know, it's all good, it's all good. What is the overriding narrative that links all these elements together? Democracy. Extending and deepening democracy. Imagine a society where you have the participation and inclu inclusion and contributions of all people in all workplaces, public, private, nonprofit, in all communities, in all institutions of the state. Imagine the energy that would arise when these people are brought in to the decision-making process. The participation of everyone, reforming old practices, creating new ones with their ideas and energy. This is about people building a society that works. So let's imagine such a society and let's go out and make it real. That is the social democratic imperative. Thank you. Thanks a, million, thanks a million, Michael, for getting us fired up this morning. Um, uh, we're going to introduce me next. I should also say we're going to be taking questions from the floor after the third speaker, so start lining up your questions. And if there's not a roving mic yet, we might get start one getting going around. Uh, Mary Morgan, would you come on? Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I want to just really address four key questions. One is just to speak a bit about the, the nature of the challenges facing us when we're thinking about a society that works. Two, 
maybe the idea of a new social settlement or a new eco-social contract as a way of framing the debate about a society that works, looking at what that would mean for sustainability and particularly in the weeks coming up to the referendum on family and care, maybe looking a little bit about how much care needs to be a very central part of a society that works. And I want to finish echoing what Michael just finished on himself, which is that all of this needs to be done in a way that is democratic and that we need to change the nature of the conversation we're having in order for it to be democratic and for whatever emerges in the future to be, to be legitimate and to have the trust of people. I think a lot of what we need is really to think quite imaginatively about the nature of the institutions. And I think Michael talked a lot about the economic institutions that can underpin a society that works. I want to talk a little bit more maybe about the social institutions. Um, I'm very aware, I mean, Ireland's social institutions have historically been very underdeveloped. We started out as a poor state. There was a bit of catch up in the era of the Celtic Tiger. And since then, we've hit recession, we've hit pandemic, we've hit an arrested development of critical social infrastructure. So we aren't in a good way. And I think our model of development has very much overemphasized the economic over the social. And I think if, if we're going to rebalance that going forward, we have to renegotiate that relationship between the economic and the social. And we need to do that in two ways. I think there's two primary problems. One, we're not maximizing the available resources that we could invest in society. And we can see that in relation to the nature of tax reliefs that we have, our corporation tax policy, tax policy generally, the Commission on Tax and Welfare said we need to invest in mechanisms to generate more revenue for future investment in what society needs. But even when we do have the available resources, my sense would be that we don't utilize the available resources well. We have tended to be very concentrating on cash income as a, as a country, putting a lot of money into welfare payments and tax reliefs, and not really investing in the primary services that we could all collectively use. So I think the focus on public ownership of services really needs to be the, the, the compass point that we follow in the future. Um, we have privatised far too many basic social services, 85% of elder care, 70% of childcare. We see the reliance in social housing on the housing assistance payment. So I think we really need to think about when we are putting investment into social services, that they are public owned services and public controlled in terms of making them work for what society needs them to be. I think one of the big problems there, and it, it, again, it relates to a, a critical infrastructure that we're missing is the bonfire the quangos that happened during the last crisis in 2012-13 when a lot of state institutions were closed down, institutions like Combat Poverty, like the Equality Authority. I think we've got a real lack of capacity for social documentation, for understanding what's going on in society. And uh, we've got data gaps, we've got limited like sort of analytical foresight about what to understand the nature of some of the social gaps that are opening up in society um, and we saw that maybe in, in the in the the November the 7th riots where you know the amount of people senior policymakers that were taken by surprise that that level of dis, dis, discontent and fracture was happening in society so I think you know th there's a lot of arguments around social investment and logics that you need to invest in things that will complement economic development and that will realize economic outcomes from the social investment, things like childcare, things like women in, in the workplace. But I do think that we need to not go down that, that line because I think it gets us to a, a false door very quickly where only things that generate economic dividends become viable for investment. I think we really need to put the social back, back on the thing. And I think when we're talking about what kind of society we want, th there's a, a, what kind of society do we value is a very big communicative debate uh, from society. It's a different kind of conversation about what do we need to do, the more, the more technical discussion about what kind of policies work. Um, and I think when we're talking about the idea of a new social settlement or an eco-social contract, this is very popular now at UN level, at EU level, um, but it requires different types of conversations to, to, to really get it out. And I think to some degree, um, I think it was Michael or Gary who mentioned Russian roulette, that idea that we're entering into a period of life where we've poly crisis or permanent crisis, crisis in climate, in inequality, in democracy, the care crisis, um, and that we need, to, we need a social settlement that's big enough and capable enough of meeting the nature of the crisis that is. So what that new eco-social settlement might be, to my mind, it needs to be very much built around the expansion of public services and a build-up of 
critical public infrastructure. And I think one way of framing that is to think about universal basic services as the core way of meeting societal needs. And it needs to be done in a way that meets both climate and sustainability needs and social inequality equality needs at the same time. It needs to be done in a way that brings people to the forefront, as Michael was saying about engaging all stakeholders. There's a co-design, co-creation emphasis on really engaging the public in what needs to be done. And I think one of the really important things is looking at state capacity. Um, we have tended to plug gaps in state capacity with the community and voluntary sector in Ireland or the market. We've tended to go one or the other. And I think right now, I mean, we saw John O'God's handing back its infrastructure to the state yesterday. We see the debacle with housing services and Peter McFerry, born out of the way the state procures its housing and homeless services. So we're, we're getting to a critical stage where the model that we're using to, 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 to bridge some of the social deficits we have simply is not working. And we need to look again in much more imaginative ways at how we build public social partnerships instead of public private partnerships. We need to realign that relationship between the state and society so that we do have the capacity to deliver the services that we want. I think that means using commissioning and procurement in very different ways, developing social licenses that demand social benefits are attached to the tenders that people get to build critical infrastructure. Because I think the way we do tendering at the moment, we're concerned about the, the, the cost of the price of everything, but, but, but not the value of anything. And I think the, the, the McVeary uh, debacle shows that really clearly. I think, you know, when we're trying to build up all that, the focus needs to be on collective public goods that we can all use to reduce our individual consumption. That's the only way, one, that we'll meet some of the carbon emission targets that we have, and two, that we can realise equality in the experience of collective goods in Ireland. So I think the, the way to do that is by universal basic services that are much more expansive than we think of them at the moment in things like transport, in things like care, housing, uh, health. If we think of public libraries, it's probably the best example that we do have, where it is a collective public service, where we all get the things we, we need, things to read, but we share them. We don't go buy the books in the private market, we, we borrow. We can do that with so many types of services if we imagine them differently. And particularly care, I think it's very apt to talk about care now when we have the referendum coming up in a few weeks' time. You know, if we think of it, we've 32 words for field. We've 40 words for, for green. The Inuit have 50 words for snow. We have one word for care, and it does such, such heavy lifting, that word. Care of, care for, care about, care with. Like, it, we, we, we need to imagine that the range of care activity that brings us from cradle to grave ourselves, that brings our families and our communities, and also our planet. Caring for our planet needs to be extended, our imagination needs to extend into that. So we very much want to echo what Michael said about the investment in reduced working time, the investment in work-life balance, the investment in family benefits really would help us to reimagine how care could be divided between the family and society and within the family between men and women in much greater ways. And there's also a generational sharing of care there that we need to think about much more. So I think we really need to focus childcare not from 70% being administered through the private sector at the moment. We need to reimagine how that's happening, introduce social licensing, so we have a much better childcare infrastructure that really meets people's needs. Um, and for that reason, I'm personally voting yes, yes in the referendum, even though I do believe it doesn't really meet our needs on care. I just wanted to finish. I've, so I've argued for an eco-social settlement, one that really prioritises public ownership of goods. The state doesn't necessarily deliver these goods, but it does regulate, manage, control, and fund them. There has to be a plurality of service providers, maybe some in the market, most probably in society and the state. But all this needs to be done very democratically. And I think we can't build a society that works without doing it with and through society, as Michael said, engaging all stakeholders. And one thing I just want to caution about at the moment that I'm seeing a lot in academic life is 
the, the, the temporal urgency, the focus on panic that's there in terms of we don't have time to do all this and we don't have time to do it maybe democratically or bringing everybody with us. Increasingly, I see in academic literature more and more tendency of political theorists to kind of talk about the, the eco-authoritarian state may be justifiable in the context of the nature of the crisis that, that we're, we're facing. But I, I want to argue that we really need to disaggregate the nature of the crisis that we're facing. Some of what we're facing is very, very urgent and needs accelerated decision making and implementation. Some of the more social transformation that we need needs slower and, and wiser processing and inputting that brings society with us. So I think we really need to talk about the brownie, talk about the nature of the society that people want and engage them in the project of transformation. But also be mindful that there are actors who will push things quickly in order to get the nature of the solution that they want without seeing that it could be bigger and broader in terms of social transformation. I think there's, there's a tendency to push for panic and we know what it leads to. It, it leads to, to division, it leads to chaos, it leads to the types of protests that we're seeing at the moment. So I think we really need to resist all encompassing narratives of urgency. It's, it's kind of too late to rush it. We need actually to avoid absolutes, to acknowledge fears. We need strong leadership to make this happen. And particularly we need that at local level. We need strong institutions, as Michael was saying, involving all stakeholders, economic democracy, but also social democracy, to really support the local responses we need to build the society that works for people. I leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks a million. Marie, that was really incredible. Do you want to come back to some of the pictures you painted around moving away from urgency? Because I think in politics we often fall into that channel. It's really fascinating. I would love to explore that a little further. Um, Liz Carroll, you've done some incredible things and you're going to speak in your seat and then we're going to have some questions afterwards. That's all right, just to maybe transition us into getting into more of the discussion side of things. Um, so my name is Liz, and I, um, I, I, I introduce myself as I work on sort of tech and society. I'm not a technologist, like don't ask me to code anything. Um, I'm a sociologist, I'm a political scientist, I'm an activist. Um, and where I come from on tech is thinking about what's the impact that it has on power on power within society, on power between ourselves and some of the institutions that are really important in our lives. And when, um, when, when, when Gary and the gang asked me to come along with the brilliant question of like, what kind of future do we want? Um, it sounded absolutely kind of slightly terrifying, like looking at where we are at the moment with you know, democracy backsliding around the world, with uh, everything that's happening in the climate crisis. Um, and with us really heading into just this fundamental shift in the technology that is governing our lives. Um, like it's really, really profound, I think, what we're at the beginning of in terms of the AI revolution, the ongoing kind of dynamic shifting in our information environment. Um, and so I wanted to just put out a couple of provocations more than anything else. Um, for this group of brilliant people here who will probably be running the country at some point in the future. So I'm going uh, I'm, I'm to use my platform to, to, to speak my mind. Um, and I think like, one of the really fundamental ones is in terms of like, the labor market or what we like to think of as jobs. <laughs> um, and I've been reading um, um, a great book on, on the history of the Luddites. And you know, the, so this is the people who went down and kind of smashed the machines. Um, and you know, there's, there's been a real maligning of the Luddites um, as these sort of you know, backwards thinking people. Um, but if you kind of get into the detail of it, what they were really rebelling against was a fundamental shift in power away from a particular type of worker and to different types of kind of corporate structures. And it didn't happen uniform, uniformly in different places. And the difference between those places was how this shift in power was managed and, and happened. And I think um, in, in Ireland in the next sort of two to five years, we're going to really see fundamental changes in especially kind of like knowledge workers, you know, like what's going to happen to the person whose job it is to be the, the, the legal assistant, like good, well-paying, knowledge-based jobs, um, this is all really, really going to change. And I think we're going to end up with a dichotomy, right? So on the one hand, we're going to be hearing, like, you just need to hustle, right? It's your responsibility to upskill and to get and to change and, and to find your way in this new economy. 
And the other end of the scale, we're going to hear smash the machines, um, right? Uh, we're going to hear that very kind of vocally. Um, and I think that's a false dichotomy. Um, I don't have the answers, but I think for a group like the Social Democrats, um, it's figuring out, okay, well, how do we start to think about this not as individual responsibility, um, not as sort of, you know, ignoring the, the um, structural changes, but how do we think about this at a societal level in terms of governance, in terms of like the kind of responsibilities that we put on, on people and on companies, um, and how do we think about it from a regulatory point of view in, in, terms, of, in terms of power. The second one I've been thinking a lot about lately is state power. Um, and how technology is starting to shift the kind of powers that state institutions can have. And we're seeing this a lot in border security, in, you know, the, so the guards this week were pushing again for more access to facial recognition technology. And I don't think anybody would argue that, like, a piece of software which can scan the, I think it's 20,000 videos of the riots would be very, very helpful for the guards right now. Um, but there are more fundamental questions of, well, do we trust the institutions that are there to be able to use and deploy this technology responsible? Do we trust who might be in charge of the guards in five years, in 10 years' time, um, to be thinking this through, and what kind of safeguards are, are, are we putting in place? So I think a lot of these questions about state power, while they might look like they're about technology, while they might, you know, people can get into, I, I often give out about algorithms and various things, they're actually fundamentally about some of the things that I think the SOC Dems are very strong on, which is what are our governance structures? What does accountability look like? for the state and for the institutions that we're vesting with some of this power. Um, the, 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 there's two other ones which are, which, are, which are very close to my heart, and one of them is what's going to happen to the information environment that we all live in over the next sort of two to five years. Um, you know, we, we can get into a discussion on sort of like AI and elections and all this sort of stuff, um, but we know that the ability to create um, falsified video, audio, all sorts of things at scales that we couldn't even imagine before is there. I think that there's huge potential in that. Like, I think as, I mean, I don't know how many people here are, are running for election this year or helping somebody run for election this year, probably most people. <laughs> um, you know, there's huge potential to be creating, like, graphics and, you know, like, like, really interesting images, right, and, like, assets for your campaign to be um, spell-checking your, <laughs> you know, your tweets or your leaflets or whatever. I think there's this huge potential. Um, but we are going to reach a point where we don't know what to trust, right? People can't believe the images and the sounds and the things that they are seeing and hearing. And so what are we going to do in, in that scenario? And again, you know, we can, we can talk about technical solutions around kind of watermarking or, you know, thinking about how we do some of this stuff. Um, but if you look at, like, I, I, I always think back to the example of vaccine hesitancy. Um, and so the UK has similar levels of, like, vaccine misinformation. This is pre-COVID, kind of floating around as countries like the US, but a much higher um, uh, acceptance rate of vaccines. And why is that? When they looked into it, it's because you can see all of this bunk and all of this bollocks <laughs> online, right? Or, you know, you, it can be kind of sent to you and it can be tailored to, you know, your triggers, you know. Um, but if you walk into your doctor's office and you know your doctor and you trust your doctor and they are able to tell you, listen, this is the research, it is safe then that good quality information compensates for all the bunk that is out there. And so again, you know, when we're thinking about like, the information crisis which is coming, yes, it's about the technology, but it's also about the funding that RTE gets. Like, people in this country still listen to and watch RTE. Like, if I'm ever doing a little thingy on the news, I get texts from ants. Like, it always amazes me how much people watch the 6-1 news. You know, they, they listen to playback. They, 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 they do whatever else it is. Same with the journal and some of the other and our news outlets. And so I think for, from a governance point of view, from a political point of view, um, what is a funding arrangement, <laughs> right, that works so that we have this shared good quality information and news is going to get more expensive and harder when our journalists are in the same position of having to do all of these extra checks when they can't trust the video and the audio and the images that are coming out. So if we want to think about this information crisis, it's also a governance crisis and, and a funding for, for our media. Um, and um, it's also about like having that doctor who you know, who you can go to on a regular basis, who you can afford to go to, um, who is able to give you the good quality health information. And the same with lots of other institutions, lots of other institutions as well. So I think this emphasis the SOC Dems have on 
you know, we don't want the five euros back in our paycheck. We want to have <laughs> a functioning state that works. And a lot of what Mary was talking about actually is incredibly important for, for the information crisis. Um, I also think it's going to be super interesting for candidates this year. Um, in a way, y'all are part of like a big global experiment <laughs> in what happens when we run elections, when we've just unleashed this incredible, this, this incredible technology. Um, my, my gut on this is that the importance of knocking on doors and all the kind of things which have, we never gave up on in Ireland um, is going to really kind of come back around. Um, you cannot get a reliable picture from the internet of what's kind of happening, and people are going to be looking at that less and less. So I think the kind of the tech piece has, you know, it kind of went from being a nice to have to a fundamental, and I think now it's the base. <laughs> and it really is about that kind of, um, the, the, the human interaction. The last thing, I'll be very quick, is, um, you know, the, like, what will all of these changes that are happening do for the relationship and the power relationship between our state and companies and, and the tech kind of industry? I think this is a unique dynamic in Ireland that we have um, in terms of um, the role that we have as a host to a lot of um, big tech companies, but also in terms of um, the role that we have as a regulator of those companies. And I could go on for a very, very long time, and I promise I won't, Gary, but just about like um, this business model that we have, this like foreign direct investment, you know, um, low corporate tax, whatever kind of business model that we have, how sustainable is that when the whole industry is shifting and the tax thing that we had is gone and everything else? And so I think it's time for us to really be thinking about what's a new national business model. Like this one has served us well since, you know, the early 90s. Um, but how many of us know like brilliant minds who spend all day trying to get Procter and Gamble to spend more on Instagram ads, right? Like how many of us, you know, like uh, what kind of infrastructure are we putting in place for people who have ideas, who want to build companies? And I think we're not bad in this country, um, but can we start to sort of like shift our dependence away from um, being the enabler of a lot of bad corporate behavior to um, what, does our, what does our future look like? That's a more resilient economic model. I'll stop. <laughs>of us said the same thing in a different way is who's framing the dominant way we understand what the problem is um, and whoever is framing it is the one who has the power to frame it and it, often it's business um, and AI controlled social media is, is often the, the most dominant frame and I think we just need to think about everything that we're hearing in, in the big framing kind of narratives we're getting and ask well who, who's creating that message and is it true? Is there different ways of understanding the problem? And I think some of the, the, the urgency framing that we're getting at the moment um, is leading us down very narrow ways of understanding what's possible as the solutions that we need to think. And I think we need to disaggregate. We need to not assume that everything is the same. So we need to say, okay, that's urgent, that's slower, that requires very quick decision making that requires a much more considered societal discussion about what to do in order to get a legitimate answer that we have the capacity to actually implement it so i think it's there's a thing called temporal imagination um, and it's it's how how do we understand the concept of time and it's the idea that some like some somebody's understanding of time is dominating our understanding of time and it may not be 
the, the, the only way to understand time. It may be that there isn't one dominant understanding of time, but that we're, we're being framed into a dominant understanding of time. If you think about it even, like even the big climate change kind of, which I'm, I'm not going to denounce at all, I, I believe what, they're, what, what I'm not a, a climate denier, but time is understood to be extremely linear um, and, and going in a particular way, whereas there's other understandings of time that are much more cyclical or circular in terms of how nature is understood and, and things like that. So I just think we need to be much more mindful about just thinking about how we understand what the problem is, who's determining how we understand it, and looking at standing back and saying, let's not fall into the trap of everything has to be done now, which is kind of what it feels like between AI and climate and all that coming at us all from different perspectives, that we are in a panic, and there are people who will manipulate that panic and push towards undemocratic, populist, authoritarian ways of meeting it. And I think that's what we're seeing in the world right now, and that we need to say no. No, we, we actually need this to be a democratic discussion, and we do have time for it. And it's really important that it is a democratic discussion and brings people with us, that we really listen to what people are thinking and fearing, because there is a lot of fear out there with the way things are changing. But I think, you know, we, we, we shouldn't go down that road um, blindly. Yeah. And, and just on that, like the, because you mentioned sort of the, you know, the AI kind of fear and the framing and this whole idea of like extinction risk, right? And like, you know, what's your, what is it, XR or whatever? What, what, what's your sense of, of whether we're going to be extinct in 10 years? That's a much more fun conversation to have than how are we going to think about the use of biometric data in, <laughs> right? In, in determining whether or not somebody gets um, refugee status or whatever, whatever, whatever the kind of the point is. Or how are we thinking about like racial bias or gender bias that's being built into some of the systems that are kind of governing governing our lives. And so I think just be wary of those. Yeah, sometimes the big, <laughs> the big kind of flashy existential things, you know, um, are, uh, they're red herrings, you know. Look at the elephant, not the red herring. Yeah. <laughs> and Michael Jordan, I believe. Oh. Yeah, I mean, uh, just, um, uh, I think that Mary made an extremely important point that we should all bear in mind when we're listening to debates and discussions because we might think that what somebody's saying is starting from the premise quite reasonable or whatever and it's about who frames the debate because that's how people and positions are labeled. I'll give you one example of that and something that trade unionists uh, and workers come up against all the time. Labor is a cost. Uh, you come across, you know, and the thing is it's everywhere. Whole, you know, IMF, CSO, all the databases, labor cost index, labor cost uh, uh, this and that. Uh, ECB sets interest rates on the basis of labor cost. Labor is a cost. And of course, we all, we don't like costs. You know, we, oh, that was a costly holiday or that was a costly night out. We try to reduce costs because profits are a good thing. Profits are very nice and all that. Well, it depends on what it's used for. When it's used for investment, they are good. That is, but the point is, profits, that was a profitable exercise. This has been a profitable discussion. You know, so profits are good. So from the very start, because the way the debate is framed and the label sticks, you're already uh, 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 on the defensive. There are other ways of framing that, but the problem is people don't get exposed to that. And you start trying to talk about it, and they don't, you know, the whole frame of mind, the whole frame of reference, they, they can't follow it because labor is a cost. When you try to say, well, it's actually a compensation, it's paid out of the value added equivalent to the profits, they have no idea what you're talking about. So that's how power can also exert its control through framing debates, you know, putting up labels, and squeezing out any alternative, uh, uh, alternative explanation. And I don't know how to get over that. If anybody has an idea, please talk to me afterwards, because you know I'm desperate to find a way of getting around this problem. Because I, am, like, mm -hmm. I actually think in Ireland we do cop some of the framing really well. Like I think if you look at the three referendums that went, like the marriage equality one and the repeal one, marriage equality we framed as marriage equality. Which was, which was a very positive framing and enabled people to endorse something maybe that they would have resisted or rejected if we'd framed it differently. We didn't frame the repeal debate about the right to abortion, although a lot of us probably that would have liked that language. We framed it as care, compassion, 
and choice and in that way enabled a much more societal understanding of something that could be embraced. And I think even now the care and the family one, there's been attention paid to trying to make sure that that's quite an inclusive framing. Um, it, it isn't necessarily, don't get, I don't think government did it that well, but, so, but there are, in, in the debate about it, there is ways of trying to make sure care can often be seen as a very negative way thing of, about controlling people with disabilities, and, and they don't want particularly to use that frame of care about their lives. And there's been attention paid to that and respect paid to that and the debate about care in this referendum. I think there are positive ways of framing that are actually mindful of people and that are conscious of the different ways that people might come at something. So I actually think we, we've learned a bit about framing in Ireland that actually other countries are coming to ask us, how did you do that? So I think sometimes the answer isn't that difficult. You know what I mean? We, we can see it sometimes. Um, there's, a, there's a great um, article, just to have a look at it, called uh, Don't Think of an Elephant um, by a guy called Lakoff. And it's basically, the, the, he talks about the right in America being brilliant at framing and that it's something that the right do much, much better than the left, is they understand the language of political discourse and framing, and they get us to think in their frames much, much more than we do. And I bet you a lot, a lot of you will think of elephants later on, because I've just framed, they don't think of an elephant. <laughs> That's his claim, yeah. <laughs> uh, right, I'm gonna open up to the floor, but I'm very conscious we've been very full of political candidates, so I am going to limit it to one minute with a question that ends with a question, <laughs> if that's okay. Just, and I am going to be strict in, in respect to the speakers and to the people who are here to see the speakers. Uh, starting off, Angela. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, and thanks for a superb um, panel, fantastic points, thanks so much. I wanted to ask the panel about the concept of um, collectivism and, and whether they feel that um, the impact of COVID perhaps brought us in any sense of uh, collectivism. Um, and I'm just thinking particularly from the perspective of healthcare, which is my own background. Um, and the, the, the sort of neoliberal approach to healthcare has worked really well to make people start to feel that they are individually responsible for their own healthcare and therefore shifting into the private sector, getting uh, public services increasingly um, underfunded. Um, but I wonder if, if we had a more collective uh, approach to healthcare, just uh, in the same way we should towards housing and education. Um, and how can we get there? How can we improve right. that? And you know, trade union membership, for example, is falling in a lot of places. Um, how how can we grow collectivism within uh, to get a better society? Thanks, Angela. Anyone in particular? Yeah. Do you want to answer that one first? Uh, take a few. Sure. Take a few. Okay. I'm going to talk, take a few. Okay, Jamie. And then. Hang on. Oh, oh. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Michael, you mentioned at the start about the living wage as one of the three points. Um, so as we know, uh, currently there's the, the uh, sub-minimum wage bans for under 18s, uh, under 20, sorry, people under the, uh, under the age of 20 who are working don't actually earn the full minimum wage. Um, so some said that is, that is kind of hard on, on small businesses, but um, just overall, as you know, it is blatant age discrimination. So, just I'd like to get your thoughts as a panel on what you know what, going forward with that living wage. What what do you think would be uh, a sustainable, kind of, kind of economically sustainable option there? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, Bernard, and then we'll come back to me. Just ask three, and then we'll get go to you. Yeah, on a similar theme, actually, um, the whole question of UBI, not least because I think with artificial intelligence, we will sooner or later, and I think later rather, experience a permanent loss of jobs. UBI and we will not be able to have full employment anymore. Okay. So I think the yeah. question of UBI rises its head strongly. Okay, it's probably similar questions as well, so I'll actually take one more and we'll, yeah, just there in front of me. Go ahead, yeah, yourself in the red. Yeah. What's, no, yourself. Hello, I'm Thomas from the Slyco Leitrim branch and AI was mentioned, and it's interesting because we actually saw a very interesting use of the application in the, in the Carrick Electoral area, where I'm canvassing for one of our candidates there, where we saw an online article written about the local electoral race in Carrick and Shannon, not from like Leitrim Observer or any Irish-based news organization, but apparently from a Hong Kong-based publication mm -hmm. by an Indian founder, who, when I delved into the website, apparently also invested a lot in AI. 
And you can kind of tell that someone was off with this article because it was focusing exclusively in like Lola and a green candidate in the same electoral area. It seemed to be a two horse race. And it just, like, it's funny and hilarious because it's so weird, I'm but it's very concerning that, like, you know, yeah. in a world where a delete from server didn't exist or if the local radio stations didn't have online presence, in future, you could have a situation where if anyone was trying to look for information at the local race, they could end up just having to deal with that sort of yeah. uh, source of information. And <clears throat> would there be any ideas for how you might tackle that in the future? Mm. That's the kind of environment you have online going forward. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm going to pass that over to the panel. So the question in relation to collectivism, um, minimum wage, UBI, and in relation to AI. Yeah. I think Mary wants to get the UBI. Yeah, I can take the collective one and the, the UBI one. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think just on, on the health and the collective, I, I, I do think that it is the way to go forward. And I, I, I think that concept of universal basic services is trying to get at that idea that if we have collective ways of meeting our needs, it can both help climate and it can deliver the society that people need and greater levels of equality. Um, there, there is some good work done on universal basic services as a way of understanding how that might be done. And it does focus on things like a plurality and a diversity of service provision. So how those services might be rolled out, particularly at a local level, may be very different. It may be co-ops, it, you know, it may be local authorities, it may be private actors. Um, but, but they're regulated by the state in a way that they're not at the moment, and they are regulated to ensure that they're socially licensed. So profit is very much controlled and is not the end objective of the delivery of any of those services, even if it's a private market actor delivering them. So I think there is a lot of work on how it could look different, but I think one of the big things, and I think Michael will probably say the same there, is just the issue of the, the, the democratic accountability of those services back so, so the local control over, over local services or whatever it would be, that that's a very important part of it. Um, and I, I think the answer to UBI, to, to my mind anyway, is linked with that idea of universal basic services. And my, my imagination about the future is that we, we get what we need primarily through the provision of services and the cash income that we need is downgraded relative to the, the need to get collective services. And I know that there's a big debate about universal basic income, which is often called unconditional basic income, which is this idea that we get a, a basic income regardless of our participation in, 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 usually it would be labor market, that it would be understood. Personally, I would go with a, a universal basic income that is conditional, um, and I call it participation income. And it's the idea of that you want to socially value, you want to reward, you want to encourage and promote types of activity from people that participate in and contribute to socially valued needs like care, like environmental work, like democracy, like strong communities. So I, I would believe that people need a universal basic income, but I would make it relatively conditional on some contribution back that makes society work. And I'm very broad about what that might be, um, but I, do, I don't particularly believe in the idea of the, the unconditional basic income as I think there's more imaginative ways about imagining how income might be distributed that also helps us meet collective needs such as climate or inequality or collective public health services. So that would be my take on it, yeah. Yeah, I might just get the, again, the, the, the UBI kind of AI is coming for our jobs sort of question. And I think people have been predicting the end of jobs. You know, I, uh, if, if you were to believe people in the 1920s, we'd all be working 10 hour weeks and luxuriating in, <laughs> in all the leisure time that we have. And I think humans have a way of sort of finding other things uh, to keep ourselves occupied. I mean, the problem with that has been that we now have, you know, lots of people who are doing things which are fairly useless, <laughs> um, right? Or which are just about kind of consumerism or, or creating more and more stuff. I mean, I think, um, uh, so I guess just like in, in terms of that, 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 that premise, I mean, I think um, uh, to, to, to my mind, it's like, what does the next phase of an economy look like and how can we ensure that people have productive ways of living um, uh, and contributing to society, like 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 Mary was saying, um, and where we have um, uh, kind of like equitable um, access to resources and to power. You know, like I, th I think there's like the sort of slightly more big picture ways of us thinking about like, well, what does 
um, a good life look like <laughs> that has meaning and that has purpose. Um, and you know, like uh, the, my my one concern about UBI, like you know, I think um, I mean I think the the the, the, the artists sort of um, uh, experiment um, that the government have at the moment is, is is a really nice sort of like I think test case for sort of. Um, Things like that, but you know, you, you you could end up in a situation where, like, like in the U.S., something like 40% of low-wage workers are subsidised by the state, <laughs> so that their employers can pay them below um, um, a living standard. And I would just want us to make sure that whatever structure we're imagining doesn't get us to a scenario where we have the state subsidizing exploitation by by, by, by employers either. And on, and on the kind of living wage thing, like um, I'm, I'm not an expert on that, but one thing that I'm thinking a lot about is, again, I think it's something like 30 or 40% of Gen Z in the US at least now have some sort of side hustle or everyone's an influencer or, you know, they're, like I think there's, there's lots of new forms of employment um, 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 emerging that don't fit within that traditional sort of living wage piece. And again, this goes to the bigger question, like what does that look like? Is that something that we want to encourage? We want to be supporting people to start their own business. We want to be supporting people to try out different things. What does a, a state support structure looks like that allows people to experiment and you know um, and, and, and and try out different things? Ideally, in a way that isn't hawking you know crappy clothes that you wear twice and chuck in the bin, which seems to be a lot of where the influencer economy is at the moment. And just on the um, on that that really interesting example from what was it Leitrim you said of like we're, we're at a point now where bad quality information is incredibly cheap to produce and profitable. Good quality information is expensive to produce and loss making, right? Um, that can't be our society. That can't be the world that we live in. Um, you know, like you can you can set up a million websites. You know, like again, if like from Hong Kong, you can be kind of doing all this kind of stuff. Just scrape a bit of data and chuck something out. Um, stick a few ads on it, and, and you've made and you've made a profit. What would it cost a local paper? I don't know what the local paper is in each. Um, to you know to go out and interview candidates and do this kind of stuff. So, you know, like, how do we fund this? And I know in, in the US, philanthropy have stepped in. So um, there's now, I think it's a billion dollars that like MacArthur, all, all these big philanthropic tax avoiders, but anyway, uh, like are putting in place to be propping up local media, right? So you don't end up with like, well, if you're a billionaire, you can buy a paper and you get to sort of set the editorial agenda, or you have to lock up behind a paywall and then access to good information becomes a luxury. Um, so again, I only have questions. I don't actually have any answers, but like for the SOC Dems, like, you know, is it about developing a policy around that? Is it about like, okay, we, we have the license fee, we have the Sound and Vision Fund, right? Is there a way for that to be going to, like, should Blind Boy be getting a bit of support from the state, right? Because he's actually doing really good quality information that targets an audience and, and meets it where it's at. Like, what does, how do we fund good quality information when running the classifieds and getting people to pay £1.50 for the paper in the, in, the, in, in the local shop is a distant memory? Yeah, I'll just get to talk to the question about living wage. Just briefly on this issue of collectivism and individualism, I know you're not kind of posing them as opposites, but in so many cases the debate does pose them as opposites, and that would be unfortunate. It's kind of like, you know, uh, Commander Spock, you know, that whole uh, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, you know, that type of thing. Um, uh, actually, the ultimate collectivist. Uh, Karl Marx described collective activity as the free association of free individuals. That is a genuine collective effort, as individuals in free, freely associating, and it's about collective effort that actually vindicates the life quality and life opportunities of each and every individual. So let's not allow people to kind of corner us, well, do you, uh, individual effort and individual ability versus collective things and all that, you know? It's kind of just a repeat of that stupid public sector versus private sector argument, which if you open up the Irish Times, you'll be able to read in David McWilliams' uh, uh, column. Uh, it's tiring. Um, living wage, are you asking, is that sustainable, or are you asking whether the sub-minimal rates are sustainable? Sorry? Sub-minimal. Sub sub-minimal. Um, well, I'm on the Low Pay Commission, uh, there will be a report short, sent shortly to the minister uh, because they specifically requested uh, recommendations on sub-minimum rates. Uh, I obviously can't kind of discuss the contents of it. Um, I go on. Let's just say 
that for those who believe in equality of treatment regardless of age, gender, uh, race, or whatever, you will not be disappointed. <laughs> and, but I make no reference at all to the specific recommendations, so, you know. Uh, um, by the way, Ireland was an outlier in Europe. We're one of the only few countries that had those sub-minimum rates, lower minimum wage rates for people based on age. We were one of the very few uh, that have those, and they've been, a lot of countries getting rid of it. Just very briefly, uh, somebody just sounded like a tech pessimist, permanent loss of jobs and, and all that. Unemployment is a political choice. Unemployment is the outcome of either malign political choices or bad political choices. Uh, 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 we should never lose sight of that. Now, yes, are jobs going to be permanently destroyed? Jobs are always being permanently destroyed. Uh, how many people are involved in the production of the Gestetner? How many young people even know what a Gestetner is? Uh, um, and, and all the, the, the machines in that. Uh, jobs are always being destroyed and new ones being created. But here's the thing. There's two aspects of this when we come to confront uh, you know, increased productivity. It means you need fewer and fewer people to actually achieve higher and higher in output. Here is an excellent opportunity to negotiate a reduction in the working week and more hours for people. Uh, because if you need less hours going in, you don't get rid of people, you reduce the hours. Uh, secondly, what you do is you capture the increased productivity from the market activities in order to actually increase the non-market activities or essentially the social activities. We know, for instance, with uh, an aging demographic, uh, we're going to need more carers. Uh, in fact, we need them now, but we're going to need a lot more in the future caring for the elderly. We certainly need a lot more now in caring for those in disability, and we need better conditions for those uh, uh, in caring uh, uh, for children. So. Those are the jobs, those are, that's just one thing, but we can capture that productivity and provide good working conditions that will attract people who will have careers in, 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 those, in that type of work and can actually create social capital, social wealth. So uh, uh, I, you know, I, I, I welcome anything that increases productivity uh, because that's a chance to reduce the working week and capture it for social wealth. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I've only got seven and a half minutes left, so I'm going to take two questions. I'm going to bring it out in the balance of the questions. Um, here, if you can, yes, sorry, sorry, I don't know your name, so just say your name, Nickman. And then I'm going to come over to yourself here in the middle, and then down the back, Bill Clear. Down the back, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Just to go back to the idea of, um, you know, a transition from public-private, which this present government is so devoted to, yeah. uh, to the public, uh, to the social, public-social partnership. Uh, one of my concerns would be how do we, how do we do that, and not bring the uh, corruption and, you know, oh. secret cabal type thing oh. that happens between the public and private mm. sector. Okay, perfect. I'm going to stop you there. If that's okay, because very quickly. But thank you for that. Um, sorry, yourself there in the middle, and just. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on alternatives to GDP? Because we talked a lot about productivity and how that's, yeah. that's viewed, but um, I think Mary mentioned we have a data gap when it comes to social uh, initiatives, et cetera, and if we don't measure it, it doesn't get done. So like, what can we do to drive more thoughts on alternatives to GDP? Perfect. Thank you. And Bill, I'm going to rush it very quickly. Can you hear me? Sorry, yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Bill Clear. I'm a councillor in uh, Kildare. Um, this morning I looked at the Lincoln Project while I was having a cup of tea. It's a campaign set up to stop Donald Trump getting, link, getting elected. The AI, his dead father, told him he was very disappointed with him and to carry on. Uh, to carry on. Is that where we're going in AI? It's so simple to produce, you can do it on your phone. It's frightening. Canvassing yesterday on the door, what's coming up on social media is not what's coming up on the door. What's coming up on the door is t um, autistic children, uh, trees, taken in charge of estates. I canvass a lot. Social media, we, we're, we're, I think it's lost. Yeah. The whole thing is lost. What's your opinion? Though? Yeah, absolutely. That's an important point, by the way. I'll put up a picture of me dog and it gets called a silo on social media, and then you knock at doors and everybody's absolutely lovely. It's no reflection of it. Yeah. So, um, corruption in terms of going back to private, pub, public private models, uh, alternatives to GDP and AI and social media, wherever you'd like to go. Michael, do you want to start? Or? 
No, I'll just to, I'll take the thing on the uh, GDP, yes, I mean, that debate's been going on for decades. Uh, in fact, if you want to Google Senator Robert F. Kennedy and uh, GDP, uh, you'll get a famous quote uh, uh, that he gave in a speech shortly before he was assassinated, where he said that the GDP measures everything except that which makes life worth living. <laughs> uh, uh, now, he was going possibly to the extreme, but he was trying to make a point. It's going to be very difficult because it is an all-embracing uh, uh, metric. It does not cover how GDP distributed. It does not cover, certainly, the ecological, environmental impact, and that is desperately needed in terms of incorporating uh, uh, that. It doesn't measure the levels of poverty. It can measure the indirect impacts, but it doesn't level, measure the level of poverty, uh, uh, et cetera. So I think it's up to us to take the other measurements and push them forward instead of necessarily looking at a replacement of GDP. Just quickly, <coughs> was, was it being suggested in the back, said something about Donald, I didn't quite hear, Donald Trump and AI. Are, are you suggesting that Donald Trump is the creation of a malign <laughs> AI chat box? <laughs> if, you, if you were, I'd say, if only, you know? Yeah, absolutely, he wasn't. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so the, on, on the, well, two things. One is, like, the truth is that it's very, very hard for us to understand what is the impact of what happens online with what people kind of really think. So if anybody wants to have a chat with me about um, what they're hearing on the doors, especially as we're heading into election season, like, we just don't have data, and my, my brain is going straight to, this is a data project. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you on that. I'm, um, but on the, like, you know, so, so, so like last week, um, I, I don't know if any of you follow the, the politics of Pakistan, but, uh, you know, Im, Imran Khan won the election from jail um, using entirely AI-generated videos of him. He even, like, they'd even generated a victory speech. Um, again, so I, I think that's, that's a really interesting act of resistance Right, you know, regardless of his politics, but you know, the, the, you, you could argue that he was imprisoned for political reasons, etc. Um, what does that mean, right? Okay, I, I, and, and I think you know, like, could Eamon de Valera come back and be canvassing, <laughs> right, and be kind of like doing these videos here in Ireland, or um, uh, name a sports person? I don't know. Um, but uh, like again, I just think it reinforces the those human interactions people have with people, um, right? Like, I'm, I'm very, I'm very curious about like when you're on the door, does that inter human interaction shift or change things? Like how solid is the thing that they saw online versus hearing from somebody who hopefully, hopefully they trust? Again, we don't understand that. Like there's a whole industry of people trying to kind of research that. Um, but I would love to have chats with anybody who wants to sort of figure that out um, uh, in, in, in Ireland and try to get a bit of data going on it. Yeah. Go on, I'll be there because yep. three minutes, 23 seconds left. Yeah, I hope you haven't given the no no campaign an idea for the, the last few weeks of the referendum. I can see holograms of Devil Era coming up yeah. everywhere. Just on, on the public social, I think I think you're right. It is very challenging to do it. And one thing that I found when I was looking at this a lot is, you know, you're always inclined to think, well, social is good, people are good community voluntary sector is good. But if you look at all the, the, the really bad controversies, a lot of them from church controlled institutions in the past, but more recently as well, a lot of corruption in the community voluntary kind of institutions. So I think it is really, really important to talk about that and to look at how our governance mechanisms of those institutions need to enable the actual well running of institutions and it's very hard at the moment to get people to be on the boards of institutions that we're expecting might deliver some of these things and that's why I go back to maybe that idea of participation income that could be used for example as a way of socially valuing that type of input that we tend to take for free at the moment so I think we really need to think hard about Charities Act you know that we're very limited in how we enable those institutions to be ran we require they run as many companies rather than as what they are which is local institutions that are run by people uh, so I think there's a lot of work to do there but it is possible to do it but I'm not I'm not naive about that there's bad actors in that sector as well. I've, I've met them. Um, and then all the alternatives to GDP, I agree. I mean, I think the worst thing about GDP is that it frames an automatic focus on growth being absolutely required. Like, it, it absolutely frames that whole debate. So the, about the only thing that we can probably do is, is to pick some, like the Human Development Index or something like that, and always make sure that that 
debate about growth is balanced by a, pro a social progress indicator that's more meaningful and begin to do that as a matter of practice. So it could be something for the Social Democrats if they get into power to insist that they would always, when you say GDP, you always say and X, so that you're beginning to, to show the different dimensions of how you can measure progress and that it's not all about growth. No, yeah. I'm also conscious of that kingdom that measures progress in terms of happiness as a format. Um, so was, but uh, Buta, yeah, the Kingdom of Buta measures it in terms of happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, that's a wrap for us. We've just gone seven minutes over time. So that was a really, really. Seconds, seven seconds, seven seconds, seven seconds. <laughs> seven seconds. It's very impressive. Um, so that was fascinating. Brilliant way of starting the day. Thank you, Thank you. And Liz. Amazing. Thanks so much, guys. I think voting's open. Yeah, I think voting's open, so go vote. I'm going to do all those things. Um,